Dr. Perry Carpenter. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to join me on today's program. Today's program is part two of our new series entitled Analysis of Motion Segment Integrity. And in, in this program, we're talking about spinal impairments as they're described in chapter 15 of the AMA guides. And I uh, hope you had a chance to watch uh, part one of this series. In that uh, first discussion, we talked about uh, what the AMA guides have to say about loss of motion segment integrity and how that relates to a loss of function uh, of the spine. And as we said, the DRE categories four for the cervical spine, the thoracic spine, and the lumbar spine are the big dogs of the spinal impairments because they provide for high levels of permanent impairment, way up in to the 20 and even as high as 28% whole person impairment due to loss of motion segment integrity. So in today's program, uh, I want to share with you uh, actual analysis of motion segment integrity as relates to a cervical spine case. And in our next session, we're going to talk about the analysis of motion segment integrity as it relates to a lumbar spine case. And I have two cases for you uh, that are actual cases. And I've chosen these cases because they represent what I consider to be real world types of cases that you could typically expect to encounter uh, in your very next examinee. Today in our cervical spine case, we're going to talk about a 29 year old female a registered nurse who had a busy series of three to four days in a row where the hospital was short staffed and she was required to uh, work uh, at extra capacity. And the cumulative effect of lifting, moving, and caring for a large number of patients uh, started the development of pain in her cervical spine, her left shoulder, and her upper thoracic spine. Well, she received uh, medical treatment over a period of time, and treatment included uh, almost everything under the sun, finally culminating uh, with medial facet branch block injections, and finally, uh, radiofrequency ablation procedures to destroy uh, pain-producing nerves in the cervical spine. This all came after, of course, conservative treatments such as medical management. She had five months of total temporary disability. She had physical therapy treatment. She had chiropractic treatment. And you might start to say to yourself, well, that's a lot for an otherwise minimal mechanism of injury of a short period of three or four days of cumulative, repetitive, and heavier than normal work. You might say to yourself, well, that's a lot of temporary disability, and that's a lot of medical treatment for an otherwise, uh, what sounds like a minimal mechanism of injury. Well, there is an explanation for that, and that has to do with some pre-existing degenerative change of the cervical spine. Uh, in a 29 year old. So the pre existing degenerative change is both unexpected and at the same time it's advanced uh, for a person of her age. And so this is the type of thing that could upset the normal spinal mechanics that we associate with the cervical spine. And that's where the analysis of motion segment integrity comes in. And that's where the analysis of motion segment integrity is beautiful because it shows you so much about how the spine is actually functioning as the spine goes through its normal movements. And this is uh, insight that can be gathered no other way. And for this reason, this is one of the reasons that I so love doing the analysis of motion segment integrity is simply for the vast amount of information that it provides us about the clinical condition of our examinee. So in today's discussion, uh, very quickly, I'm gonna show you how to do the measurements, how to do the calculations, and how to decide the clinical significance of your findings. Uh, one thing that you're going to notice uh, as you begin to do more and more of these analyses is that you're going to come up with findings that are outside the ranges of what the AMA guides describe as normal. Well, those findings may or may not have clinical significance, and those findings may or may not relate in any way to permanent impairment. That's where your clinical decision making, where your skill and your expertise come in, because it's you ultimately that have to make a decision as to what the significance of these findings represents. 
So I'll show you in this case how I decided in some of the thought processes that I used uh, in coming up with both the permanent impairment rating and the apportionment determination. And we'll talk about those two things, the permanent impairment rating and the apportionment determination in our very next session. Today we'll focus uh, simply on how to make the measurements and how to do the calculations and how to decide uh, what is the significance of those findings. Okay, so with no further ado, uh, let's go straight to the x-ray images. Okay, so here we are and we have the images uh, on our screen. Uh, just a couple comments before we get into the actual measurements. Uh, and that is, by the time you get these images on your screen, it represents a great victory. And I talked about this a little bit in first, uh, our first session of this program. It's uh, sometimes very difficult to finally get the imaging facility to produce the images exactly the way that we need them. And to coordinate all of the details in getting the examinee to the uh, imaging facility, getting the imaging facility to properly process the patient, properly process the images, properly label the images, and get us the images done in a way that uh, is consistent with the requirements of the AMA guides. And I say this because I've experienced this frustration myself hundreds and hundreds of times, and I continue to receive calls from doctors who say that they simply give up <laughs> on doing the analysis of motion segment integrity because they simply just can't get it done. They can't get all of the steps coordinated and specifically, they can't get the imaging facility to cooperate in a timely fashion. In fact, I was just speaking with a doctor yesterday, and he said he's at uh, the end of his 30-day timeline, and in that 30 days, he simply was unable uh, to make this happen or to get this to happen. And so uh, by the time we actually get the images, uh, it represents a great victory, as I said. And as you do more and more of these, and as you communicate more and more with the imaging facility, you'll get better and better at anticipating the snags and choke points uh, that each of the involved parties uh, goes through and has to uh, hurdle in order to end up with a finished product, which is uh, diagnostic quality x-rays that we can actually use. So in this case, we succeeded, <laughs> we got, all the parties on the same page and we've ended up now uh, with our images. And so let's begin in this case simply by looking at the lateral cervical. And uh, you'll notice here that this is the software that comes uh, with this particular uh, imaging facilities images. All imaging facilities have a different type of software that they use. Some are more or less sophisticated than others. Uh, this one is fairly sophisticated. And don't be intimidated by the softwares. They're all generally uh, quite intuitive. And with just a little bit of practice, uh, you'll become quite adept at manipulating through all of the different tools uh, that they provide us. So let's just zoom in here on the uh, lateral cervical and just take a note of what it is. Uh, oops, <laughs> as I was saying, as I was saying, Let's take a look at the lateral cervical and let's zoom in on this so that we can see some of the detail. Okay, now this is a 25, 29 year old female and you see that she has a loss of her normal cervical lordosis. And in particular, if we use the magnifying glass, you see that there's a, a region of advanced degenerative change and a buckling uh, of the normal cervical lordosis right here at C2, 3, 4, 5. This is at C5 and C6. There are circumferential osteophytes on the inferior end plate of C5, circumferential osteophytes, although to a lesser degree, on the end plate of C6, and projection of those osteophytes posteriorly into the spinal canal. So that's going to uh, uh, narrow and stenose uh, the cervical spinal canal. And that's going to contribute uh, to some of our findings for loss of motion segment integrity. So for a 29-year-old female, I'm sure you'll agree, especially if you're a chiropractor, uh, 
that this represents uh, a badly diseased neck with advanced degenerative change for someone of this age, 29 years old. I mean, this process has been uh, in place now for some period of time, some years. This has been progressing for some years. Well, this represents a pre-existing condition of the cervical spine. This was not caused by the industrial injury, but this is a condition that was accelerated, was lit up and was aggravated uh, by the industrial injury. And that'll factor in to our apportionment determination. Okay, so let's go ahead and make our measurements uh, for motion segment integrity. Okay, so let's now go to the cervical flexion view. Okay, so here's the flexion view. Let's uh, enlarge that a little bit so that we can make our measurements. Okay, now with this particular software, the measuring tool is right up here. And we'll need to activate that for every measurement that we take. But let's now begin by uh, drawing our flexion lines. We draw one uh, through the uh, anterior and posterior tubercles of C1. And then we draw one through the uh, anterior inferior and anterior posterior corners of C2. And we record our angle. And I'm just uh, writing these down. These are flexion angles. Now you'll notice that the angle, 34.6 degrees between C1 and C2, that's an extension angle. So make sure to record that as a negative angle. Some of these angles are gonna be flexion angles and they'll have a positive angle, but extension angles, make sure that you record those as negative. And be very meticulous about your angles as to whether they are positive or negative angles, because of course that will affect uh, your calculations. Okay, so now that's our C1, C2 angle. Let's draw our C2, C3 angle. It's gonna be right there. And then we'll simply reproduce or recreate the first line that we did. Now notice this is a flexion angle. This is uh, the uh, the lines back here posteriorly are diverging and they're converging anteriorly. So that's a positive 4.8 degree flexion angle. And let's just blow this up a little bit more. So we can really get a look at what we're doing. Okay, how's that? Okay, this is our C3, C, C3, C4 angle. And notice how precise these digital tools allow you to make these angles. I really like the precision that's uh, offered with these modern software programs. That's a positive 7.1. And you'll notice how quickly you can produce these angles. I mean, this analysis does not take a long time. positive 19.1 degrees. Positive 10.7. <clears throat> and that is at the three, four, five, Six. That's C5, C6. And then finally, let's draw C6, C7. And that's positive 10.8 degrees. Okay, so those are our flexion angles. Now let's go to the extension angles. Blow this up. 
Okay, and let's measure our angles. We'll draw our line through the anterior and posterior tubercles of C1. Across the inferior end plate of C2, and that's a minus 40.9 degree angle. Next one, C2, C3. Minus 7.5 degrees angle. Minus 18.4. And notice that these are extension or lordotic angles. Blow this up a bit. Here we go to the anterior aspect of the osteophyte, to the posterior aspect of the osteophyte. Duplicate our inferior end plate above. That's minus 12.8. Next level, ten degrees minus ten degrees even, and then finally C sixty seven. Beautiful, minus 4.1 degrees. Okay, so we, that, that shows you how quickly it is uh, to obtain uh, those angles. Let's now go to our chart or our table wherein we take these angles and we make our measurements and we make a determination as to the significance uh, of these measurements. Okay, so here we are and we have our measurements now. So what are we going to do with those measurements? Well, we come into the diagnostic studies section of our report, and I'll go over that with you in just a minute. But we're going to enter those uh, measurements into a tabular format within the body of our report. And the table uh, looks about like this. We have our spinal motion segment over here on the left. We have all of our flexion angular measurements all of our extension angular measurements, and all of our total angular measurements. And if we remember what the AMA guy had said uh, about uh, our formula for measurements, we can pull that up. And the AMA guys give us uh, the formula that we go through in order to determine the presence or absence of motion segment integrity. So the AMA guides tell us that we take our flexion angles and we subtract our extension angles to come up with total angular motion. So here is the formula uh, right out of the AMA guides. This is the flexion angle minus the extension angle, and the extension angles are mostly usually going to be negative numbers to give us our total angular motion. And so the chart looks like this. Now, before we go over uh, the measurements and the calculations, let me just say a couple words about the diagnostic studies section uh, of your report. It's in this section of your report that you have an opportunity to report to the reader of your report all of the findings of the diagnostic studies that have been taken uh, up to the date of your evaluation. So in this example, you see that this injured worker had x-rays in 2014. She had a left shoulder MRI in 2014, and she had all these studies. And this is one section of the report where you report the entirety of all of the findings, not a synopsis and not a summary, but the entirety 
of the significant findings uh, of all studies, including uh, your studies that you ordered for this evaluation. Now, when I order uh, new studies for the qualified medical evaluation, I usually put a phrase in my report such as follows. Uh, in order to obtain Mrs. Jones' current condition, I referred her to a local imaging facility for updated x-rays, and those were completed on such and such date. The report of findings of those studies, as described by medical radiologists, included, and here you put all of the findings of the medical radiologists, and then you follow those up with your own, your own interpretation and your own findings of the same studies. And uh, we reviewed this in part one of our program wherein the AMA guides advise us, and let's just go to that section. The AMA guides advise us here that whenever possible, the physician should personally review the studies and report agreement or disagreement with previous interpretations. A summary of the studies should be included in a separate paragraph or section. So this is the perfect opportunity to report uh, your agreements or disagreements and your findings in its own designated section that follows immediately after the physical examination section uh, of your report. Okay? So we obtained the studies. We've done our measurements. Let's, uh, let's find out how those measurements are going to impact our opinions or conclusions. So here I've input all the flexion angular uh, measurements. I've input all of the extension angular measurements. And uh, I'm being very careful to mi mind my positive and minus signs. And over here is our formula wherein we can perform our calculations. And just as a reminder, uh, I've highlighted these two measurements to remind us, to remind you and to remind me that these are positive angles. Now, most of our extension angles are lordosis angles and those are negative angles. But here we have two measurements that represent positive angles. And remember when we measured those, those lines were diverging posteriorly, giving us positive 10 degrees and positive 1.2 degrees. So. Those are vertebrae that fail to um, move into lordosis with extension movement of the spine. So I just have those highlighted so that we perform our math calculations correctly when we get there. Okay, so now for C1, C2, we have all our measurements, we perform our math calculation, and we come up with 6.3 degrees of angular motion. So the question is, is that normal or is that abnormal motion? Well, the AMA guides tell us that in the upper cervical spine, there is little flexion extension, while the lower cervical spine permits increasing flexion extension movements from about 10 degrees at C2, 3, C3 to about 20 degrees at C5, C6, and C6, C7. So 6.3 degrees qualifies as little motion. So that's roughly consistent with AMA guides descriptions. Now at C2, C3, the AMA guides tell us that about 10 degrees, 10 degrees is normal motion. Well, if we do our math, positive 4.8 degrees, moving into negative 7.5 degrees, that gives us 12.3 degrees of angular motion, roughly consistent with 10 degrees, I considered that to be normal. At C3, C4, we had plus one, plus 7.1 degrees of flexion, moving into minus 18.4 degrees in extension, total angular motion of 25.5 degrees. Now the guides tell us that uh, angular motion increases from about 10 degrees to a maximum of about 20 degrees at C5, C6. So what would be considered normal motion then at C3, C4? Well, something between 10 and 20, perhaps roughly 12 degrees, 13 degrees, 14 degrees, maybe 15 degrees. 
and then again at C4, C5, we might expect to see 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 uh, degrees would be roughly consistent with the AMA guides. Well, here at C3, C4, we're getting 25.5. I consider that to be increased angular motion. Here at C4, C5, we're getting 31.9 degrees. I consider that to be increased angular motion. Now, in addition to these uh, ranges of normal motions, uh, total angular motions of 10 to 20 degrees, the AMA guys tell us that in the cervical spine, angular motion of more than 11 degrees compared to the adjacent segments above and below equals loss of motion segment integrity. So here at 25.5 degrees, this is more than 11 degrees greater than the total angular motion at C2, C3. It's actually about 13.2 degrees greater. So that indeed qualifies under the strict application of the AMA guides as a loss of motion segment integrity. Uh, here we have 31.9, then at C5, C6, notice we have 10.7 degrees of motion inflection moving backwards only to 10 degrees in extension, total angular motion only approximately 0.7 degrees. So this represents greatly decreased motion. And this would be roughly consistent with what the DRE categories describe Let's look here at the DRE uh, category four. Now this is lumbar spine, but this is the language that the AMA guys use. They say uh, may have complete or near complete loss of motion of a motion segment. Complete loss or near complete loss. So what would you consider 0.7 degrees of total angular motion to represent? that would certainly represent near complete loss. And depending upon who's doing these measurements and how these measurements are done, uh, these measurements could very easily uh, come out to represent complete loss of angular motion. If this one measured in at 10 degrees, I mean, another examiner might measure that at 10 degrees and conclude that there's a complete loss of motion of this motion segment. Well, what can be stated for certain that there's, is that there's certainly decreased motion, nowhere near the 20 degrees that the AMA guides describe uh, as normal motion for this level. Similarly, at C67, we have only 9.6 degrees of total angular motion as the spine moves from 10.8 degrees in flexion backwards only to 1.2 degrees, does not even go into a negative angle a lordosis angle uh, for total angular motion of only 9.6 degrees. So I concluded that there was multiple levels of loss of motion segment integrity where the uh, degenerative segment of the spine, which is C5, C6, has almost no angular motion uh, consistent with a functional fusion, functional fusion at that level almost no angular motion, and then increased compensatory motion at the segments, two segments uh, above the functionally fused segment. So very interesting, and this is the beauty of the analysis of motion segment integrity. This provides for us information uh, that can be obtained no other way, no other way. In fact, this person on physical examination could have uh, near full and complete range of motion globally. But when you look at the range of motion segmentally, you see that uh, it's uh, dysfunctional and not uh, moving as it should with uh, angular motion evenly distributed among the vertebrae. In fact, in this case, we have some vertebrae that are not moving at all or moving very little and other uh, vertebrae that are compensating uh, with excess motion. So this is the beauty
uh, of the analysis of motion segment integrity. Now, what we decide to do with these findings uh, is based upon our clinical judgment, our experience, and our expertise. And these findings may or may not contribute to your opinion or conclusion on permanent impairment. So in our next session, I'm going to show you uh, how these findings contributed to my opinion uh, for permanent impairment in this case, and then how the apportionment determination was handled to take into consideration the permanent impairment due to other factors, considering that she had pre-existing condition. Uh, of the cervical spine that contributes to this loss of motion segment integrity. Okay, so doctors, I hope this helps you. Uh, I think you'll agree with me that the actual analysis of motion segment integrity uh, is quite easy. It doesn't take a long time to do, and with the uh, measuring tools that these modern softwares provide us, uh, it's quick, it's easy, and it's accurate, and it's actually quite fun to do because, uh, as the previous example demonstrates, it gives us tremendous insight into the function of the cervical spine that can be obtained no other way. And that's why the AMA guys require that we assess for loss of motion segment integrity in every single case. Now, some doctors will say that the AMA guides uh, require uh, a history of trauma for the assessment of motion segment integrity, but this is clearly an example where this examinee uh, had no trauma at all. Hers was more of a repetitive and cumulative uh, type of injury absent uh, what we would conventionally call trauma. So it's my opinion that we must, must, must assess for motion segment integrity in each and every case. Now, just because we find a loss of motion segment integrity doesn't mean that the entirety of that impairment, if any, now let me back up and say, just because we find loss of motion segment integrity does not mean that that loss of motion segment integrity, number one, qualifies for permanent impairment. Number two, if it qualifies for permanent impairment, this is not to say that the loss of motion segment integrity is due entirely uh, to the industrial injury. We're simply taking the necessary step to identify any permanent impairments as they may exist. So we must, must, must assess for motion segment integrity or the loss or the alteration of motion segment integrity in each and every spinal injury case. That's my opinion. And that's the way I handle my cases and I've never uh, uh, received an objection to that. So it's a required procedure. Implement this in every single spinal case because it gives us tremendous insight. And as, as the present example shows, the spinal mechanics of our cervical spine are greatly uh, dysfunctional. And that uh, explains uh, many things about the protracted uh, medical treatment, the failure of medical treatment to bring her back to a pre-injury status and her ongoing report of symptoms and activity limitations, even two years after what would otherwise be considered a minimal mechanism of injury. So the analysis itself is actually the easy part. The hard parts are number one, getting <laughs> the images done properly in the first place uh, is like climbing Mount Everest, it seems. And then number two, once we have the information uh, and our measurements done and we've made an assessment as to normal motion, increased motion or decreased motion, what do we do with that data? And how does it factor into our opinions and conclusions? And that will be the topic of our very next session. So for today, I hope you enjoyed this presentation and I hope you are greatly relieved that the procedure uh, is simple and easy and that you yourself actually uh, can do this, that you can, you can do this, okay? So this is Dr. Perry Carpenter. I look forward to being with you uh, on our very next session and for now, I'm wishing you best of success as a qualified medical evaluator.